thanks so much for joining us and just hanging out and just sharing with us about your testimony and serving our country and God. So if you would just start it off by telling us your name, your rank, and the uh, branch of the military that you served, and, and then why you joined. Okay. Um, my name is Bill Ratchford. Uh, I was in the Air Force. I uh, enlisted in November of 1963 and got discharged in August of 71. Uh, I um, got out as a staff sergeant, which was an E-5. Um, while I was in, I was, my job title was a radio intercept analyst since I was in the intelligence business. And um, I was in the Air Force component of NSA. And um, when I was doing that, I would have never told you that, but now I can particularly when NSA being on the news all the time. People know what it is now. When I was in the service, they didn't. Um, and I you want to know where I was stationed? Wasn't that one of your yeah, questions? Yeah, talk about uh, where you served us, if there were yeah. any chores of duty that you did. Yep. And what motivated you to join to begin with? Okay. Talk a little bit about your family. Um, where I was stationed, I went to Texas for almost a year for basic training and tech school. And after that was over, I went to uh, Darmstadt, West Germany for three years. And I re-enlisted there to go back to NSA, which is at Fort Meade, Maryland. I spent three years there. And then I went to Saigon, Vietnam for six months. And then I got discharged and went, actually went back to Maryland to finish up my uh, education. So that's where I was when I was in the service. And um, <clears throat> oddly enough, I. I doubt I have a story like most folks. Um, I was not drafted. Actually, I was in Vietnam four or five months when I got the letter from my draft board telling me I was too old to be drafted. My mom sent that to me. I thought that was rather interesting. Um, the primary reason I went into the Air Force was to get an education. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that sounds uh, maybe a little crazy, but when I was the oldest one at eight, and when I was about 17, my dad um, was diagnosed as having a mental illness, was ultimately diagnosed as being a paranoid schizophrenic. And so my mom, all of a sudden, who had, she had never worked outside the home, had eight of us to take care of by herself. And um, a few years before that, my grandpa Ratchford, my dad's dad, told me, he said, to get yourself a good education because it's something nobody can ever take away from you. And that stuck with me. And, you know, as the Bible says, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, you fed him for a lifetime. So that, that statement by Grandpa just hit home. And I knew that I wanted to get myself a good education. And, of course, with Dad out of the picture and Mom having eight of us to take care of, that wasn't going to happen if I stayed home. So um, I, after I got out of high school, I went to, to, went to work and I went to the Northern Extension of University of Kentucky here in, uh, I think it was Park Hills, for a year at night school. And I thought, well, this will take me forever, doing a couple courses at a time. And a couple guys I worked with over at the phone company, whenever we were talking to uh, Army and Air Force recruiters. So I went over and went with them a couple of times. And I asked this one Air Force recruiter if the Air Force had a program where you could go to school. And he said, yeah, we do. And it's um, named it whatever it was, he said, if you get approved for it, then they'll send you to school and pay your tuition. And that sounded pretty good to me. So I told mom that's what I was going to do. And uh, that was my primary motivation for going into service. And I, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, left on November the 4th, 1963. That day was my mother's 41st birthday. So I'm not sure if that was her way of getting me out of the house or if it was a real sick way of having a, a, a birthday. I do understand that as the plane left the, the Greater Cincinnati Airport that she did cry. So I knew she missed me when I left. But um, it was, that's where it started. And um, went to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio and then you know, on. And when I was in Germany, I took night classes through the University of Maryland. And then when I re the reason I re-enlisted to go to NSA was so I could be close to the University of Maryland to go to school. And by the time I left there, headed to Vietnam, I was within a semester of getting my degree. And that's why I went back there after I got out of service to finish up. So I, I would think uh, if there's young folks that watch this or see this 
and they have a desire to get an education and they don't know how to get it done, uh, consider looking at the military because they do have the, the GI Bill and you can take classes while you're uh, on duty. And now with all the internet stuff, uh, your possibilities are just unlimited. Um, so I, I took advantage of that. I was able to get an education, got out with no student loans like they have today. But uh, that's what kept me in. It took, it took a lot of work to go to school and you know uh, work because there was plenty of times when uh, I'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and study from 4 till 6 because I had to be at work at 7. I get off at 3. I'd study for a couple hours because I had a night class that went from 7 till 10 p.m. So my day was a long day, but I did that for a long time. And it um, took me nine and a half years to get through, but I, but I did it. So if you buckle down, you can get the job done. And when you're working, you're actually serving the country, so talk about just the sacrifices and, and what happened in Vietnam, and talk about, uh, I think you mentioned you had other uh, family members that were in your service as well, too. Yeah, when I was in um, Germany, I hadn't been there too long. I got a letter from my, my brother, Ron, who was the next oldest boy. Ron was 14 months younger than me. Uh, he had, had enlisted in the Marine Corps, and his letter said he was going to Vietnam, and I just, I just lost it. I just figured he'd die. Um, but he didn't. So, um, you know, did I, little did I know that four years later or so I'd wind up in, a, in at least in the same country. Um, my tour of duty was significantly different than his. He was a, what they called a tunnel rat. He was literally crawling through tunnels, digging out the Viet Cong, and somehow he survived a year over there. Um, lost most of the guys he was with, but he, he came back. But um, uh, like I say, I was in the intelligence business, so I was writing reports and what have you, and it was all top secret stuff, so couldn't tell anybody what we were doing. It, all the, you know, the Russians and the Chinese and the Vietnamese, they know what you're doing because they're doing the same thing to us. What they don't know is how effective or ineffective we are at it. And we, it goes on today, as we all know, because all we do is watch the evening news and it, uh, the CIA and the FBI and NSA are all over the news. But um, back then, n nobody ever heard of NSA. I remember when I came home on <laughs> leave one time, I was talking to my neighbor who lived right across the street. And he asked me, he said, what, what are you into in the service? And I said, why you ask that? And he said, I had um, somebody here from the OSI asking all kinds of questions about you. And they, they do a, a very extensive background check before they give you a top secret clearance. And uh, I said, I'm just, you know, clerk in the office. That's about all I can tell you. But um, he never did know what I did. So, but we were um, eavesdropping on, and when I was in, Europe, in Germany, on the, West, the East Germans, the Czechoslovakians, the Hungarians, the Yugoslavs, the Polish, the Russians, what have you. And then with, if you take bits and pieces of information and kind of put it together like a jigsaw puzzle, you can see what's going on. And then because there's a lot of things, particularly in the military, it's very structured and very logical and, and things go by the number. So if, if you know what the process is, you can take certain pieces and extrapolate into the future what will happen, where it will happen, and some semblance of a timeline. And that still goes on today, only much more sophisticated than we ever did it. But um, <clears throat> that's what I did both at, well, in Germany and at NSA and at um, Saigon. Just Saigon, it was all what was going on with the Vietnamese and the Chinese. But um, I guess one thing, when I was in tech school out in San Angelo, that's when the, it was the summer of 64, and that's when the Gulf of Tonkin incident occurred. To me, that's where the, the Vietnam War started. That was the incident that started the war. And so I was in um, tech school there, and literally eight months before that, I was in basic training, and that's when President Kennedy got assassinated. So like most folks my age, they can tell you where they were when Kennedy got assassinated. I was in basic training in San Antonio. But um, nothing glamorous about it, just kind of doing the grunt work of piecing stuff together, and then, it, you, you know, the further up you go in the, the hierarchy, you get to the colonels and the generals and stuff, and um, they get reports from all over. 
and that's when they can really piece things together as to what might be going on. And uh, that's why in today's world, when we look at what's going on in, in uh, Korea, President Trump gets stuff, uh, at, obviously at the very highest level, um, he gets a lot of that stuff through NSA and the FBI and, well, CIA. And um, that's kind of how they figure out what they think is going to happen next. Did you have a lot of friends that enlisted at the same time you did? Yeah. Actually, from here, uh, no. I, nobody went in. That, um, I'd been out of high school about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Lackland with probably seven or eight guys, but we were all from the greater Cincinnati area, but I didn't know any of them. Um, but oddly enough, I still stay in touch with probably four or five guys I was in the service with. I had a, a friend in Pocatello, Idaho, um, a, a widow of a guy I was stationed with at NSA. She lives in Seattle. Another couple that's in Albuquerque and a retired colonel that's down in San Antonio. And I email them on a regular basis and stuff. So it's, you know, we've gotten much older, but it's interesting to awesome. <laughs> see what goes on with them. Yeah. Now, you were recently inducted into the Kentucky Hall of Fame for... Veterans Hall of Fame, yeah, in um, okay. um, 2014, that's three years ago, yeah. So how did you achieve such an honor? Um, well, after looking at some of the other guys who got in, I'm not sure that I belong there, to be honest with you, but um, the, the Veterans Hall of Fame is to recognize post-military service. Um, in order to be a candidate, you have to be uh, honorably discharged uh, from any branch of the service, and um, essentially what you have done since your term in the military is, is what gets you into the Veterans Hall of Fame because they're looking for um, men and women who have continued to serve in various capacities. And um, probably what got me in there is when I was in um, Washington in the insurance business, I was active in our professional association for 20 years. Um, when I moved here to, uh, back home to Kentucky, I was on the Holly Hill board for six, seven years and was active with the Boy Scouts and uh, been active at church for, I don't know, 17, 18 years. Um, and I've been involved with uh, city government for you know, six, 16, 17 years. So that, that kind of continued uh, public service uh, is what got folks into the Veterans Hall of Fame. Bob's well, quite an honor. I, that's just very humbling. Yes, it is. Yeah, we appreciate it. Is there anything else? Because a lot of the reason why this is so, so passionate on my part in just trying to communicate the message, you know, to our younger generation, you know, the high school, um, you know, and younger adults is just, you know, freedom's just not free. No. I mean, the, the sacrifices that you paid personally, your brother paid, and other family or members of our community, I think you've mentioned that, you know, there were four of the guys here locally that had gone into the service about the time you did, and, and the outcomes weren't as, as gracious as yours, if you will. And, and sometimes the sacrifices that they pay, it's, they give it all. They give their life. They, 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 yeah. The blood gets spilled to defend the freedoms that we fight for so desperately day in and day out for our country. And, you know, you're, you're helping to bring to life, you know, the, the history books and what we're studying and, and what that means. Yeah. And, and I'm just so grateful for that. Well, I grew up in Highland Heights back on Sunset Drive, right close to where NKU is today. Mm -hmm. um, Within a quarter mile of the house that I grew up in, there were three guys that, got, that died as a result of Vietnam. Um, um, actually, all three of them in the Army. And uh, one guy didn't actually die in Vietnam, but he died on his way back home after he'd been discharged. Plane crashed into a hillside in, I think, 1974, 75. And that was his discharge flight on the way home. So he's not listed as a casualty of Vietnam, although he was seriously injured over there and spent several years in hospitals. But because he was being discharged, he didn't die as a result of Vietnam. But to me, he, did. he was in a Boy Scout troop with me. And uh, there were two other guys that, were, that lived literally less than a quarter mile away, and, and those three died. I didn't. Yeah. 
I, why? I don't. Why? God watched over me. God to, yeah. Used you in yeah. other ways, like yeah. you said, to continue to serve our community and and others around you. And it's just so was that a huge part of, of who you were before you went to the service, or did you develop that love of community and serving as a result of being in the service? Or well, um, I guess I, I grew up patriot. When I was a kid, I was at a Boy Scout, and I was an Eagle Scout at age 15. And uh, I was active in, in my um, church. I went to Asbury Methodist Church down on Highland Heights. And um, I was an active kid in, in high school and, you know, the Honor Society and different clubs and stuff. So I've always been a social animal. That's just kind of how God wired me. And so I'm that same social animal today at age 72. So some things don't change. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say um, overall my military experience was a very positive one. Um, fortunately, I did not face any enemy fire. Nobody shot at me, tried to kill me, what have you. Um, so I was very, very blessed. And uh, I, would, I would encourage anybody that if, um, if, if they looked at spending some time in the military, uh, it can only do them good because you become very organized. Um, you learn how to get the job done. Um, you, you learn how to, if you will, take orders, which is very good if you want to get married and stay happily married for a long time. Um, but you, you, you develop a, a, a sense of camaraderie for folks and a love of country that I, you don't get that elsewhere. Um, there, there's a um, there's a camaraderie among veterans that doesn't exist elsewhere. So I would say if, if you have the least bit of interest in the military uh, or you're uncertain about your future, give it a shot, look at it, because there are tremendous opportunities. Um, the, probably one of the best tests I ever took was a, they give you an aptitude test to try to find out once you're in the service what do they do with you. And uh, as everybody knows, we're not all wired the same. And I, I took this test. They give you, I think, four scores. And one of them was an, an electrical score and a mechanical score and then a general score and an administrative one. And I did horribly in the mechanical and the electrical and um, pretty well in the other two. But, I, you know, I, there's a reason I don't work on cars and, and build things. That, that's just not in my DNA. I get brothers that do that stuff, but that's not in me. So that little test was very, very helpful. Um, and as I looked at what I did out of the military, um, I got a business degree. I worked at uh, an insurance company as a systems analyst. So I've, I've been a, a thinker and, um, you know, I'm kind of a geek, as my daughter called me. Um, so that, that just the, the sheer experience of being involved in the military was very helpful to me, and I think as you talk to other men and women who were in uniform, they would probably agree with that. Although some had uh, very harrowing experiences that I did not. But um, my experience was very good. Awesome. Does anybody else have any other questions or anything else? Bill, thank you so much. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah.